بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Welcome to the next installment in our lecture series on the reign of quantity and the signs of the times. Today we will be looking closely at chapter 13, <coughs> the postulates of rationalism. Straw my pencil. The postulates of rationalism. This is an extremely, uh, I think, important chapter. I think it's also a rather dense chapter. It's spread just over six pages, <clears throat> and there is a lot to discuss here. I think that, uh, again, I could have said a lot more on this topic, uh, but he didn't in this book, but he has in other works. And he mentions this uh, very early on in the opening um, paragraphs to this chapter. So the first point to understand is that there is rationalism and there is rationalism. So what do we mean by that? Um, Genom um, characterizes what he understands as modern rationalism as being a manifestation of the exclusion from all mystery from the world. That's what he says in the opening sentence. It has just been said that the moderns claim to exclude all mystery from the world as they see it in the name of a science and a philosophy characterized as rational. So he's directly moving on from the previous chapter where he talks about the, the hatred of secrecy. And I think it's significant <clears throat> to note that the word mystery that he puts in square quotes here, where he says that the moderns claim to exclude all mystery from the world. He puts the word mystery in these little quotation marks. Mystery in Greek uh, is a word in English that comes from the Greek um, mus musterion, if I'm not mistaken. And in Greek it means secret. So again, he's connecting this with the hatred of secrecy. So there is a structure to this book. And so you shouldn't think, although it's easy to sometimes wonder like, where is he going with all of this? Do these chapters really connect uh, together? They do. Uh, so he is building on the previous chapter of the hatred of secrecy. And so rationalism, as Genel understands it, is this attempt to get rid of something that is above and beyond reason. So you remember that when he's negating, or sorry, when he, when he is denouncing the hatred of secrecy, the, the, the hatred of secrecy, as I said, um, in the previous video is also the hatred of superiority in the human realm and and hierarchy in the realm of knowledge well hierarchy in, in the human realm as well and it is a kind of idol the idol of egalitarianism and a rep and a, a a manifestation of this mania for excuse me uh, uniformity now I'm just going to skip around a little bit. So I said that there is a rationalism, that there is rationalism and there is rationalism. <laughs> so if we simply speak <coughs> of reason in act, and Geno mentions this on page 91. So uh, before we start going through this page by page, as we, all, as we do skipping some portions, I'm just going to skip around a little bit and try and make these key points. So on page 91, he talks about, again, having <clears throat> once again denounced the egalitarian idea. Um, he speaks of the confusion between reason in act with rationality, insofar as rationality in itself is a character specific to the human being, qua human being, the human being as such. Al insan min haythuhu al insan. And there's a footnote here in which he speaks of the classical definition of the human being, al-insan, as, as al-hayawan al natiq in Arabic, or here it says a reasonable animal, but it's man is a rational animal, or the human being is a rational animal. And rationality there, as opposed to reason in act, the day-to-day -day use of, of, of most rudimentary forms of reason, which we find in all human beings, as opposed to rationality as what is called a specific difference in logic. It is what's called al-fasl in Arabic logical terms, 
In uh, English scholastic philosophical logical terms, it's the specific difference that distinguishes the thing trying to be defined from the genus. Um, and so rationality in this regard is present in all human beings. Um, but human nature is different in the sense that although the basic human nature is found in each and every person, its, manifest, its manifestations are quite variegated. And Genon says this by saying that human nature is, of course, present in its entity, in, sorry, is present in its entirety in every individual, but it is manifested there in very diverse ways, according to the inherent qualities belonging to each individual. In each, the inherent qualities are united with specific nature so as to constitute the integrality of their essence. To think otherwise would be to think that human individuals are all alike and scarcely differ among themselves. Okay. So there is a, a legitimate kind of rationality, which is the specific difference of human beings. But what he means by the postulates of rationalism in the modern world is something else. And he offers a definition on page 90. So I think this is useful, what I'm giving you, because it allows you to, if you keep these points in mind, and if you go back then and read the chapter, <coughs> you'll have a better idea <coughs> of what Gennel is trying to say. So on page 90... He says, rationalism, it's, let's see, page 90, one, two, three, four lines down. The fourth line is mid-sentence, and then towards the end of that line, a new sentence begins. Rationalism, in all its forms, is essentially defined by a belief in the supremacy of reason proclaimed as a veritable dogma and implying the denial of everything that is of a supra-individual order. The key word here is supra-individual. Please make a note of that. If you are not averse to writing in your book, underline it or highlight it. Some people don't like to write in their books. Do as you like, but take careful note of this. Let's read it again. Rationalism in all its forms is essentially defined by a belief in the supremacy of reason proclaimed as a veritable dogma and implying the denial of everything that is of a supra-individual order, notably of pure intellectual intuition. And this carries with it, logically, the exclusion of all true metaphysical knowledge. This is a very important passage. So, mere rationality is to be distinguished from intellect, which is of a supra-individual order. Now, this is extremely interesting. Now, in Arabic, the word aql is used to convey both. Just a simple exercise of human reason, human ingenuity, if you like, as opposed to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the intellect, um, or what we may speak of as the transcendent intellect, or the supra-individual intellect. And that would be denoted in other languages, such as Greek, by the term nous, and in Latin, by the term intellectus, from which we get the word intellect. Sometimes, in English, you could reuse the term intelligence as well. But in Arabic, typically, in Arabic philosophical texts and even religious texts, the word aql is used. So, that if you refer to al-usul min al-kafi in Arabic, kitab al-aql wal-jahl, the book of the of the intelligence and, and ignorance, or the book of intellect and ignorance, this is the first book that opens the um, uh, foundational principles of this book of hadith known as Al-Kafi, or the sufficiency, which contained the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad and the Shia Imams. <clears throat> the term Aql occurs many different times, but it has a different sense depending on context. And <clears throat> the intellect then in the Islamic understanding Aql is somewhat different than than that of the nous in uh, in Greek. So I just want to give some examples of this. I think they will be useful. <clears throat>
to those who are following this course of lectures, especially those who uh, come from an Islamic background or those who are interested in this tradition. So the very first hadith um, goes back to the fifth Imam, Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. And he <coughs> says, لَمَّا خَرَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَقْلُ اسْتَنْتَقَهُ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ In other words, when <coughs> Allah created the aql, the intellect, that's how it translated is here, he made it give utterance. He made it to speak. He gave it the power of speech. Now again, this is a symbolic language. I'm not. I, I for one, do not take this literally. It's not some sort of a human being walking around. So in any case, he gave it the power of speech, or he made, caused it to speak. <clears throat> and then he said to it, <clears throat> He said to it, advance, come forward. And it came forward, it advanced. قَالَ لَهُ أَدْبَرْ فَأَدْبَرَ And then he said to it, retreat, move backwards, and it moved back. ثُمَّ قَالَ Then he said, وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي I swear by my might and my glory, or my majesty. مَا خَلَقْتُ خَلْقًا هُوَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْكَ I have not created a creation more beloved unto me than you. وَلَا أَكْمَلْتُكَ إِلَّا فِي مَنْ أُحِبْ And I <coughs> have not caused you to come to completion or to perfection. In other words, to go from a, from a state of potentiality to complete actuality except in someone whom I love. أَمَّا إِنِّي إِيَّاكَ أَمَرْ And as for myself, it is through you alone or by virtue of you that I command. And by virtue of you that I forbid and by virtue of you that I punish and reward. Now this is a very different conception of intellect than what you find among the ancient Greeks. That's the reason I, I want to read this. Because people say, well, the aql in Islam in this context is the same as the Greek nous. Not exactly. You don't have anywhere in any Greek or Platonic or so-called Neoplatonic text any sort of explanation of aql along these lines. <clears throat> now then, there's another hadith, just one more, saying of uh, the sixth Shia Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam and um, 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 the, uh, he was asked ma la aql somebody asked him what is the aql what is intellect he said qala ma ubida bihi rahman wa ktusiba bihi jinan in other words aql intellect is that whereby the infinitely compassionate is worshipped or that thing by virtue of which ar-Rahman the infinitely compassionate which is Allah God is worshipped and that by virtue of which the gardens, it's literally, means the garden, you know, paradise is attained to. Then the questioner, who isn't explicitly identified here, asks a follow-up question. He says, then what about, then what did Muawiyah have? Now you have to remember that Muawiyah, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, mm -hmm. is the person who contested the Khilafah or the Caliphate of Ali bin Abi Talib, and um, he is a notorious figure, uh, particularly in the history of Shia Islam, <clears throat> and is deemed a usurper, and is the person who established the Umayyad dynasty, a usurping dynasty. A dynasty which usurped the rights of the House of Hashim, the Banu Hashim, the family of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. So he said, Tilka nakra tilka shaytana wa hiya shabihatun bil aqal wa laysat bil aqal. <coughs> he said that was diabolical cunning. Mm. And it may resemble intellect, but it is not intellect. So there are some people <coughs> who are very clever, we might say, in the simple profane exercise of, of the, the simplest level of rationality, the ability to make distinctions, make rational choices, in the case of Muawiyah, you know, uh, um, strategic decisions, tactical decisions, we mm -hmm. might say, decisions that do have 
moral implications, political implications, right, uh, that go hand in hand with human free will. But they might be the wrong actions to take from a moral and ethical sort of perspective, right? <clears throat> so in that regard, then that is an, a <clears throat> misuse of reason, right? So it's not the same as intellect or intelligence, which has a transcendent and supra-individual character. Now, what makes this more complicated is that in ancient Greek thought, specifically that of Aristotle in the De Anima, in his book uh, On the Soul, he talks about a certain kind of noose and, or intellect, and that is what is called the nous poeticus. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the poetic soul. It means, it's usually translated as the active intellect or the active intelligence. In Latin, this is known as intellectus agens, or intellectus agens, I suppose, if you want to go with some archaic pronunciation, I suppose, of Latin. And so the agent intellect, as it is also known, is considered to be the formal dimension, the morphe, uh, aspect of nous. Now the problem is when Aristotle discusses this, it's in De Anima th Book Three, so it's three point four point four twenty nine a. Um, ten and then twenty one to twenty two and then four twenty nine b six. If you know how to refer to De Anima. It's not really clear what he's talking about, and there is a very important book by Herbert A. Davidson entitled Al-Farabi, Avicenna, Averroi, and Averroes on Intellect, which really deals with whole this whole question. The subtitle is their cosmologies, theories of the active intellect, and theories of human intellect. So it really has to, so this agent intellect, or active intellect, has to do with how it is that human beings come to know things. And in the scheme of emanation, which we find in Al-Farabi, which is a development and elaboration of the scheme of emanation which we find in Plotinus and was adopted by Avicenna. Instead of three levels, what are the three hypostases in Plotinus become ten intelligences or ten intellects. And the tenth is the active intellect or the agent intellect. And it was considered to be identified in some sense with God Sometimes it may be identified with the angel Gabriel. It depends on who you read in Islamic philosophy. But human beings were, you know, there would be certain sort of extraordinary human beings who could directly connect with the agent intellect, and these would be the prophets. This is the theory of prophecy that you find in Al-Farabi. So is this what Genel has in mind? It's not entirely clear because he also doesn't specify, but he obviously understands intellect to be of a transcendent and supra-individual order and have a supra-individual character. Um, and so it, it, Herbert Davidson, in, the, in actually the very first opening of this book on page three, which is the first page, he says, the most intensely studied sentences in the history of philosophy are probably those in Aristotle's De Anima that undertake to explain how the human intellect passes from its original state of ignorance, in other words, in which he says it does not think to a subsequent state in which it does. That's really what's happening in De Anima Book 3. I mean, if you haven't read De Anima, then some of this is going to be... Uh, but De Anima, or Aristotle's book on the soul, is absolutely fundamental. It's very important if you want to understand things in Islamic philosophy that come later. I really, really urge that you read it. There are many good translations. Um, have a look at that. In fact, maybe I should do a De Anima reading list at some point in terms of the different translations. Uh, but Aristotle, uh, continues Herbert Davidson, started from the presupposition that human thoughts reflect the external world without distortion. Okay, this is obviously not what happens in later philosophy, and he says this, the antithesis of what would be Immanuel Kant's perspective. It's also the antithesis of Hume, if you know about modern philosophy. Mm -hmm. Reasoning that the presence of any inborn quality would color thoughts received by the human intellect and hence prevent the intellect from performing its assigned task, he found the human intellect to be a part of the soul which has the ability to become each thing, but in itself originally has no nature whatsoever other than the ability to think. So the intel intellect becoming the intellected, 
is a kind of unification. And this idea is developed at length centuries later by Mullah Sadra and is known as the, un the unification of intellect and intellect, or Ittihad al Aqil bil Maqul. So this is very complicated. Uh, there's a lot going on in Aristotle, but suffice it to say, we'll just conclude with this further down in the second paragraph on page three in Herbert Davidson. He says, just what Aristotle meant by potential intellect and active intellect, terms not even explicit in the de anima and at best implied, and just how he understood the interaction between them remains moot to this day. So <laughs> I just want to put that out there for you to think about but it is clear that Genon here in this text is distinguishing between mere reason and intellect. So between what in Latin would be ratio versus ratio versus intellectus. <clears throat> now. Rationalism is also, in um, modern philosophy, so it's very important to look at terms. Um, if, if we refer to the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, second edition, a third one has come out, but I don't have it, by Robert Audi, Cambridge University Press. If you just look up rationalism and see what it says there, uh, L-M-N-O-P-Q-R. Sorry, I, I apologize. I thought I had uh, marked this with a post-it note, but I have not. So there's very different kinds of rationalism, but just rationalism, this is on page 771, column A. Rationalism, the position that reason has precedence over other ways of acquiring knowledge. So in that sense, it would be contrasted with empiricism, and in empiricism, it would be the senses, the five senses, which would be, uh, which would have precedence. So that would be, you know, hard rationalism. But the rationalism that Genel has in mind here is is intimately connected and deeply wedded to empiricism as well. Inasmuch as it reduces everything to the level of matter, quantity. Uh, here he says rationalism in all its forms is defined essentially defined by a belief in the supremacy of reason, right? But empiricism goes with that. So it's important to uh, simply point these things out before we uh, dwell any further. Now, I said that Genon could have made this chapter longer. It's already about six pages, but he talks at length about rationalism in two other books. And he references these in the footnote on page 89. One is the crisis of the modern world. And there, uh, the key chapter is chapter five, which is individualism, especially page 57 mm. of this edition. And then the book East and West, pretty much the whole book, but there are big portions there that are relevant to this uh, uh, chapter, chapter 13, The Postulates of Rationalism, especially chapter 2, The Superstition of Science, which is about 25 pages long. It's pretty long for a Genonian chapter. Right. Uh, we'll look at some of those. So if you go to page 57 of The Crisis of the Modern World, he sheds further light on this whole notion of rationalism. <clears throat> Now, he sees rationalism as a development of individualism. That's why it's in this chapter called Individualism in the Crisis of the Modern World. So he says, as we are speaking of philosophy, we shall mention some of the consequences of individualism in this field, though without entering into every detail. First of all, there was the negation of intellectual intuition, again, and the consequent raising of reason, the ratio above intellectus, above all else. This purely human and relative faculty, remember the example of Muawiyah, being treated as the highest part of the intelligence, or even as coinciding with the whole of the intelligence. This is what constitutes rationalism. It's a very important passage, if you want to understand chapter 13 of Reign of Quantity. And this rationalism, he tells us, is founded by Descartes. Descartes is fundamental. A, a tremendous shift in human thought takes place with Descartes. In mathematics and physics, it has very far-reaching <coughs> effects. Descartes is an inflection point in the history of human thought, and in the uh, and is one of the the 
not widely or well known other than to probably people to Genon and people who read Genon chapters in the dark history of the Kali Yuga. He continues, uh, this is what constitutes rationalism, whose real founder was Descartes. This limitation of intelligence was, however, only a first stage. Before long, reason itself was increasingly relegated to mainly practical functions. In proportion, as applications began to predominate over such sciences as might still have kept a certain speculative character, and Descartes himself was already at heart much more concerned with these practical applications than with pure science, scientia in Latin. More than this, individualism inevitably implies naturalism, etc., etc. That's the relevant portion I wanted to read from the crisis of the modern world. So, here on this page, also on the very opening page, uh, page 89, uh, paragraph 2, at the bottom of the page, he says, Let it be recalled then that rationalism properly so called goes back to the time of Descartes. And it is worthy of note that it can thus be seen to be directly associated right from the beginnings with the idea of a mechanistic physics. You do not get a me me mechanistic physics until Descartes. And things really come to a head later with who? It's Hawk Newton. Yeah. Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the development of something called calculus... And it's really important also to note that Geno had a lot of reservations about calculus in its modern form. That he set out in his most impenetrable and difficult book, The Metaphysical Principles of the um, Infinitesimal, infinitesimal calculus. calculus. It's very much a book about infinity. If you don't have a really, really, really deep grounding in, in uh, calculus, mathematics, and a lot of the history of mathematics, the notions of modern number... Uh, and people with people like Dedekind or Dedekind and uh, Cantor and Bolzano and Weierstrass and you know, you've, early uh, number theory. Yeah, a lot of people who study mathematics they know these names because the, these these mathematicians have have their names associated with different theorems and results. But a lot of the philosophy and the thought that goes that went on behind it it's very complicated. So Newton is involved with calculus. So is Leibniz. Mm -hmm. These are key names in the in the emergence of a mathematical, a mechanistic mathematical physics in which quantity, quantification, a notion of, of, of um, infinite space and uh, time are um, fundamental and they really go back to Descartes Then they undergo other metamorphoses with, with uh, Einstein and so on. So that's rationalism. Okay, so the denial of everything that is of a super-individual character or order. We're on page 90 now. This denial has other ramifications. What are they? This same denial, says Genel, has also a consequence in another field, the rejection of all spiritual authority, which is necessarily derived from a supra-human source. Rationalism and individualism, again, you see how they go together, are thus so closely linked together that they are usually confused, except in the case of certain recent philosophical theories, which, though not rationalistic, are nonetheless exclusively individualistic. It may be noted at this point how well rationalism fits in with the modern tens tendency to simplification. So you see how all these ideas are coming together, the, with the discussion of individualism in the crisis of the modern world, the hatred of secrecy, which implies the hatred of authority, hierarchy, um, the tendency towards simplification, um, um, uniformity against unity. All of these things are, are, are connected in this book. So the rationalism fits in with this modern tendency of simplification. The latter naturally always operates by the reduction of things to their most inferior elements and so asserts itself chiefly by the suppression of the entire supra-individual domain in anticipation of being able later on to bring everything that is left, that is to say everything in the individual order, down to the sensible or corporeal modality alone. Corporeal just means, you know, physical bodies. And finally, that modality itself to a mere aggregation of quantitative determinations. So any given physical body, you know, this has a certain mass, it has a certain volume, 
Uh, this is made of glass, so that glass has a certain density. It has various properties, and they all are expressed in a quantitative relation, in, as, as quantities, and quantitative relationships such as density. Okay. Uh, so this is all an example of these steps. And he says that they're all linked together and they are, constitute a movement or of stages, so to speak, in a process of continuous degradation and a kind of uh, uh, solidification, we may say, of the world, which is the name of another chapter that comes later. There is yet another kind of simplification inherent in Cartesian rationalism and it is manifested in the first place by the reduction of the whole nature of the spirit to thought and that of the body to extension. This reduction of bodies to extension is, as pointed out earlier, the very foundation of mechanistic physics and it can be regarded as the starting point of a fully quantitative science. And this is extremely important to understand because before Descartes you don't have this notion <clears throat> of uh, analytic geometry. We, to this day, we call it the Cartesian coordinate system, mm -hmm. where you have points in an infinite expanse of space, whether two or three or even n dimensions, and each point is designated by coordinates, which are measurements relative to, to, uh, to axes that have a point of origin. <clears throat> and that's very different than the geometry of Euclid in the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. And through that, you have a completely different understanding of conic sections very different from what we have in Apollonius of um, Perga. Perga. So these are ancient texts. Very important to understand this. And I think that very few people nowadays um, are cognizant of these connections. I remember when I first encountered this book many, many years ago in my 20s, most of it was just beyond me. I didn't understand it. Even though I had studied mathematics and things, but I had, had I really... Um, so that's why it's very true that sometimes things take a very long time to understand and you need to undergo certain experiences. And even though I was educated in mathematics, we didn't read Euclid. Hmm. We covered the material in the first six books of Euclid. That's what's usually done, in, in at least in my day. Who knows? It's probably been dumbed down even further. But we didn't do it in the way that Euclid does. Demonstration. And... We did. We did all those proofs and so forth, but there was no mention of Euclid other than just in the beginning. Oh, this is the guy who invented this, and um, so they so things are not studied in the same sequence with uh, with the common notions and all those discussions oh. and and the, the propositions. That that's not how it's done. And when we studied uh, conic sections, it was purely in the form of analytic geometry. And it was many, many years later when I learned about Apollonius, and I thought, wow, man, how did this guy do this without benefit of analytic geometry? Because <clears throat> with analytic geometry, then the way that you express a line, well, that's a linear equation. Then you have quadratic equations. Mx plus b and, and all that. Yeah, so a line is basically, there's different forms. The, the slope-intercept form of the equation is, you know, y is equal to mx plus b, where m is the slope. B is the y-intercept, but you can write that in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, Ax plus y plus c equals zero is one form that they write it. And then if you if you want it in three dimensions, then it's you add a z yeah. coordinate and all this. So I'm totally out of my element here. At any rate, so yeah. it's it's a very different approach. And when we studied physics, we we had no notion that with, with Newton, you have a completely different understanding. You don't have the concept of force. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. You don't have these relationships. Um, what's that fam famous book by Jacob Klein about this, this shift from Greek to you know modern algebra? Greek mathematical thought and... Let me, I can yeah, it's that. a famous, famous book, and it's it's maybe not very readable for most people, but uh, I think that Klein was... Ah, Greek mathematical thought and the origin of algebra. Yeah, I think Klein was was very, uh, very perceptive there in that yep. book, and uh, I think he originally wrote it in German, and it was translated by that famous lady, Eva Brand. Mm -hmm. 
at uh, St. John's College, uh, Annapolis. So there was fundamental shifts in the understanding of, of, of mathematics, in the understanding of mass, in the understanding of force, um, and s space and time as well. There's a world of difference there. Um, and the key point, which Genon doesn't really mention here, in turn, that is that really takes place in modern science, especially in modern, let's say, physics or, or um, natural science, as opposed to philosophy of nature, natural science, you have the negation, rejection, and repudiation of certain fundamental principles in natural philosophy that go back to Aristotle. Natural philosophy being physics, the quest for the phusis of things. Mm. And they are his four modes of explanation of the four causes. Namely, formal cause, efficient um, material cause, efficient cause, and final cause. Modern science rejects, modern science is really only interested in what is known as the efficient cause or efficient causality or the agent cause, al-fa'il, al illat al fa'liya in Arabic, and al illat al madiya yeah, madiya the material. It has rejected formal cause, and it has rejected final, final cause, teleology in nature. That's a major shift. And so, with this kind of rationalism, we have the emergence of a completely uh, quantitative science uh, and I want to spend some time on that but before we do that let us look at what happens in the human re realm page 92 and Genon says on the other hand to return to things that actually are purely human so, um, Locke the founder of modern psychology was evidently inspired by the Cartesian conception when he thought fit to announce that in order to know what the Greeks and Romans thought in days gone by, for his horizon did not extend beyond Western classical antiquity, it is enough to find out what Englishmen and Frenchmen are thinking today, for man is everywhere and always the same. Again, I absolutely hates this. He says, nothing could possibly be more false. Yet the psychologists have never got beyond that point. For a while they imagine that they are talking of man in general, the greater part of what they say really only applies to the modern European. Right. Does it not look as if they believe that the uniformity that is being imposed gradually on all human individuals has already been realized? And that uniformity is much more so today than when Genon wrote these lines. He goes on by saying, It is true that by reason of the efforts that are being made to that end, differences are becoming fewer and fewer, and therefore that the psychological hypothesis is less completely false today than it was in the time of Locke. Again, that systematic vacuity of the individual that Jacques Ellul talks about. So that's where we are today. Um, so, all of that is established. What about this purely quantitative science? And this is what Genon turns to next at the bottom of page 92. That much being established, it still remains to explain why rationalism, why rationalism, is linked to the idea of an exclusively quantitative science, or more accurately, why the latter proceeds from the former. In less roundabout language, he's posing a question. That question is, why does an exclusively quantitative science inexorably emerge from rationalism? That's a beautiful question, but in answering it, unfortunately, Genon sort of muddles the whole discourse that comes up over the next... Um, uh, three pages or so by referring to Henri Bergson. Bergson lived between 1859 to 1941. He's a French philosopher and I don't really think his ideas are terribly relevant to this. And Genon doesn't either, but Bergson apparently was right about certain things in his view, in Genon's view. But he doesn't really refer to which book of Bergson's he has in mind where he mentions these things. I haven't read Bergson. I don't care to. Um, and so the discourse that comes after that is a little bit hard to follow because he keeps, uh, you know, he's using Bergson as a kind of sounding of board or the works of Bergson in question to, as a kind of point of departure. Oh, so... Um, Where do we begin with this? So first of all, he says Bergson speaks of intelligence 
And again, Genon says, no, it's not intelligence, it's reason, but um, to be more particular, it's a, uh, to be more correct, it's a particular way of using reason, again, based on Cartesian conceptions. Uh, and then he has this, so, is, so finally on page 93, he says, thus it is that Bergson, if one takes the trouble to rectify his mistakes in terminology, so he's giving a rereading of Bergson, mm -hmm. the positive points of Bergson by correcting his terms. He says, gives a good demonstration of the faults of rationalism. And then he, he has his parenthetical, which he loves. And of the insufficiencies of reason, but he is no less wrong in his own turn when to fill the gap that's created, he probes the infrarational instead of lifting his gaze toward the super-rational. Okay, great. So what does he do? So, further on, further on down the page, he says that when Bergson reproaches reason, to which it is only necessary here to restore its rightful name, for artificially clipping reality. So he says reason artificially clips reality. So reason takes, to use a different image, takes a particular snapshot or, or cuts something out and copy pastes it and leaves off the rest of it, brackets off a certain aspect or dimension of reality and neglects the rest of it. So here, in this clipping, what Bergson has in mind is thinking in terms of the reduction of all things to elements supposed to be homogeneous or identical one with another, which amounts to nothing but a reduction to the quantitative. That's the point he's trying to make. For elements of that kind can only be conceived from a quantitative point of view. So, in other words, this <clears throat> focus on reason and that there's only that reason or rationalism or that reason is the supreme sort of arbiter of things inevitably leads to a quantitative science because it rejects the pole of quality. Mm -hmm. And so this is regarded as the inevitable tendency of reason when reduced to itself to materialize everything in the ordinary sense of the word. This is at the bottom of page 93. That is to consider in all things only their grossest modalities because quality is then at a minimum in relation to quantity. So over on the next page, on page 94, Gennon says, if one looks at the existing state of scientific conceptions, it is quite certain that they represent as nearly as is possible the last or lowest degree of materialization. The degree in which solidity understood in its material sense has reached its maximum and that in itself is a particularly characteristic mark of the period at which we have arrived so what are some of the characteristics of this um profane quantitative reductive science so i think it's very interesting uh to have a look at some uh, remarks and observations made by the contemporary uh, scholastic or Thomist philosopher Edward Fazer in his book Scholastic Metaphysics a Contemporary Introduction because what most modern people are immersed in consciously or unconsciously is scientism mm -hmm. they do not recognize how deluded they are and science, because it is an exclusively rationalistic science, because of this clipping, to use the term of Bergson, cuts itself off thereby at the outset from the full spectrum of reality. So on page 18 of this book, Fazer talks about what he calls the explanatory limits of science. If there are limits to what science can describe, there are also limits to what science can explain. He writes very well. So what he has in mind here is a fundamental problem faced by scientism, and that is the notion of laws of nature. In terms of which science explains phenomenon, and that these laws of nature cannot, in principle, provide an ultimate explanation of reality. Now, there is a famous modern physicist who is often associated with a modern evolutionary biologist. Mm 
that physicist is Lawrence Krauss, and that biologist, evolutionary biologist, is Richard, Richard Dawkins. Dawkins. So Lawrence Krauss wrote a very idiotic book. And I'm usually not that sort of condemnatory, but here that's the only term that really works. Entitled A Universe from Nothing. 2012. Mm -hmm. So Fazer writes, Krauss initially gives his readers the impression that he's going to give a complete explanation in purely scientific terms of why anything exists at all rather than nothing. The bulk of wow. the book is devoted to exploring how the energy present in an otherwise empty space, in otherwise empty space, together with the laws of physics, remember this discussion of laws of nature, might have given rise to the universe as it exists today. All by itself. This is at first treated as if it were highly relevant to the question of how the universe might have come from nothing, until Krauss acknowledges toward the end of the book that energy, space, and the laws of physics don't really count as nothing after all. Then it is proposed that the laws of physics alone might do the trick, though these two, as Krauss implicitly allows, don't really count as nothing either. Krauss's final proposal is that there may be no fundamental theory at all, but just layer upon layer of physics, which we can probe until we get bored. That's on page 177 of, of his book from 2012. So that, of course, is going to lead to an infinite regress of laws of physics, which Fazer points out. Fazer continues, now the problem here is not only that this is a bait and switch, though it is that, since an endless regress of laws is hardly nothing, and vaguely speculating on the basis of no evidence whatsoever that there may be such a regress hardly counts as a serious explanation. The deeper problem is that Krauss not only does not deliver on his promise, but that he could not have done so, for any appeal to laws of nature or a series of layers of such laws simply raises questions about what a law of nature is in the first place, and that's not a scientific question, it's a metaphysical question. Mm. How it has any efficacy and where it or other series of layers comes from. And these are questions which the scientific mode of explanation, which presupposes such laws, cannot in principle answer. I think that's a very important point to keep in mind. The status of laws of nature is a topic we will have reason to consider at, something, at some length later on in this book. And I recommend this book highly. But for the moment, and we'll just finish with this, but for the moment... We can merely note that none of the standard approaches gives any aid or comfort to scientism. We might hold, for example, that to speak of the laws of nature that govern some material thing or system is simply a shorthand way of describing the manner in which the thing or system will operate given its nature or essence. This, as we will see, is the scholastic approach to understanding physical laws. But on this view, the laws of nature presuppose the existence and operation of the physical things that follow laws. And in that case, the laws cannot possibly explain the existence or operations of the material things themselves. In particular, and contrary to writers like Krauss, since the ultimate laws of nature presuppose the existence of the physical universe, they cannot intelligibly be appealed to as a way of explaining the existence of the universe. That's very nice. Um, so, this modern exclusively rationalistic, empirical, and material science is not competent to answer these fundamental questions because behind them all, even in this truncated science, this modern science, there are certain metaphysical ideas and assumptions that you have to engage with, which mm -hmm. modern science does not because of the way that rejects things. And um, how are we doing on time? We're 48 minutes. I just wanted to just yeah. add to that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, when I was doing my, my lab class in my mm -hmm. freshman year, we dealt with this sort of dichotomy in science between how and why. Yeah. And um, I was always arguing in my classes that um, the constant investigation of how things in nature uh, are the way they are. For example, we would cut open a flower. and examine yeah, that. Sure. I remember I cut open a... It was the first time I really looked at a flower, right? I cut open a sunflower in half. And I tried to... Because we had read... Um, I don't remember his full name. Goethe, who wrote a very famous book and poem on the metamorphosis of plants. And mm -hmm. I tried to determine and where... Goethe is always known. I think it's Johann Wolfgang Goethe. Goethe. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I tried to determine where uh, 
the metamorphosis was taking place between, you know, you had these kind of yellow leaves on the outside and how those became yellow. Mm -hmm. That was the reason why I was cutting it open. And well, he has a whole idea about colors also. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had to pr make a presentation about what I had found. We were given like maybe an hour and a half to look at this. And I basically said um, that the constant investigation of how these things are it really necessitates one to ask why these things are the way they are. You really have no choice because, mm. like you're saying, your reason eventually will extend itself far enough to the point where you just have to ask why. Otherwise, you're not getting a full, cohesive explanation of, of the whole story, so to speak, mm -hmm. of, of a sunflower. Or I remember we dissected a cat one time. Um, it just seems that... Uh, figuring out the formal and the final cause um, mm -hmm. is necessary to um, uh, coming to a full conclusion about any given object in nature uh, or, or determining some kind of law of nature. Yeah. And laws of nature, I think Genon would say, are principles, right? Mm -hmm. Which these guys don't start with. So I don't know what Krauss is talking about when he talks about laws of nature. Yeah, well, this is a big subject. I think Fazer's book, Scholastic Metaphysics, Contemporary Introduction, is really good. He followed this up with another really important book called Aristotle's, Aristotle's Revenge. Revenge, The Metaphysical Foundations of Physio Physical and Biological Science. And Side by Side with Scholastic Metaphysics is another work of another scholar in the same vein and same school of thought. Um whom Fazer acknowledges as being a deep influence on his book Scholastic Metaphysics, and that's David S. Oderberg's book Real Essentialism. Um, so we're not going to get into all these, but these are very interesting works, and if you have read them, they're not easy works. Um, it will give you a very good understanding of things which um, Genon is just referring to in a very concise and synthetic fashion, mm -hmm. um, in summary form. And if you bear those in mind and then investigate modern science and the philosophy of science um, rooted in Aristotelianism, not a modern philosophy of science, mm -hmm. then, then you will understand really a lot of what he's talking about. And because of this rejection of transcendent, transcendental sort of idea, of a tra transcendent intellect or super individual intellect, Regardless of, how, of which of the different ways you interpret it, whether it's, I think, as you find in Al-Farabi or even uh, Ibn Sina or um, even Aquinas, uh, or in the commentators of Aristotle, it's something very different. And it give, gives rise to a different kind of science, a different kind of scientia, mm -hmm. uh, which we have in the traditional sciences. And, and Genon dwells at length on that in his book East and West. And I think there's some really interesting things we could uh, point to in this book. So in the chapter, the superstition of science. So he doesn't even use the term scientism. He calls it the superstition of science. He says on page 27, opening lines of this chapter, which is the second chapter in East and West, the civilization of the modern West has, among other pretensions, that of being eminently scientific. It would be as well to make it a little clearer how this term is to be understood, but that is not what is usually done, for it is one of those words to which our contemporaries seem to attach a sort of mysterious power, independent of their mm. meaning. Science, with a capital letter like progress, capital P, and civilization, capital C, like right, capital R, justice, capital J, and liberty, capital L, is another of those entities that are better left undefined and that run the risk of losing all their prestige as soon as they're inspected a little too closely. In this way, all the so-called conquests, which the modern world is so proud of, amount to high-sounding words behind which there is nothing, or else something insignificant. We have called it collective suggestion. Mm. And the illusion which it leads to, kept up as it is and shared by so many people, cannot possibly be spontaneous. See, again, he's alluding to this sort of level of propaganda and occult warfare, I would call it. Mm. Um, Evola spoke of the occult war in a way that is a kind of 
propaganda and mind control, indoctrination, social engineering. Um, he says, perhaps one day we will try to throw a little light on this side of the question. I don't know that he did. Ebola certainly does in Men Among the Ruins. But for the moment, that is not what we are directly concerned with. We simply note that the modern West believes in the ideas which we have just mentioned, it, if indeed they may be called ideas, however this belief may have come to it. They are not really ideas. Because many of those who pronounce these words with the greatest conviction have in mind nothing very dear, nothing very clear, excuse me, that corresponds to them. Actually, there is nothing there in most cases but the expression, one might even say the personification, of more or less vague sentimental aspirations. These are veritable idols, the divinities of a sort of lay religion, which is not clearly defined, no doubt, and which cannot be, but which has nonetheless a very real existence. It is not religion in the proper sense of the word, but it is what pretends to take its place and what better deserves to be called counter-religion. Uh, we could read a lot more of this, uh, but I think you get the point. So scientism, the superstition of science, is a kind of religion. It's a counter-religion. It's a pseudo-religion. And when people who are deeply imbued with it and indoctrinated in it and committed to it encounter a truly profound science emanating from the transcendent intellect, from a realm beyond the realm of mere ratio or reason, they are in a state of profound incomprehension. Mm. And he gives an amazing example of this. And that is when another extremely important character in the development of modern science and mathematics, Leibniz, mm. when Leibniz encounters the ancient Chinese divinatory work, the I Ching, which we mentioned in, a, in the previous lecture, and how utterly simplistic and off the mark and how absolutely childish and puerile his understanding was of that. Mm. So Genon uses that as an example. I think we'll just give this example and then finish off today. He says on page 44, in the same chapter of the superstition of science, the Europeans have so high an opinion of their science that they believe its prestige to be irresistible, and they imagine that the other, peop that other, that the other peoples must fall down in admiration before their most insignificant discoveries. This state of mind, which leads them sometimes into strange misunderstandings, is not altogether new, and we have found a rather amusing example of it in Leibniz. <laughs> this philosopher, as is known, had planned to establish what he called a universal characteristic, that is, a sort of generalized algebra, made applicable to the norms of every order. Instead of being limited to quantitative notions alone, Moreover, this idea had been inspired in him by certain authors of the Middle Ages, especially Raymond Lull and Trithemius. Uh, Raymond Lull and Trithemius, or Trithemius, T-R-I-T-H-E-M-I-U-S. Um, interesting figures in their own right. I uh, recommend people to, uh, to do searches on them on the internet and follow up. We can't dwell on them. But they're important thinkers in their own right, influencing Leibniz. In the course of the studies which he made toward realizing this project, Leibniz came to be engrossed with the meaning of the ideographic characters that constitute Chinese writing, and more particularly with the symbolical figures from which the basis of the e, which formed the basis of the I Ching. Now, whether Chinese writing is ideographic or not, you know, there has now been, I think, some interesting investigations in the area of linguistics and the visual representation of language by especially oriental systems of writing by a, a Romanian uh, linguist named Florin Popescu. You should refer to his works, but we'll just leave it at that and you know, say that there are ideographic characters. Um, so Leibniz in his writings describes the I Ching. So you have to understand in the, the I Ching is a symbolic text. It's of exceeding and uh, of great antiquity, <laughs> and it is a philosophical understanding uh, 
a metaphysical understanding and symbolic language of the modalities of change, represented by symbols, namely of a solid line and a broken line. And Leibniz tried to reduce this to a system of binary mathematics of zero and one. Mm -hmm. And so in this system, you have what are called trigrams, where you would have three possibilities. So you either have three solid lines, three broken lines, and then, then you know you have one broken, then one solid, then one broken, and so forth. And so how many do you have? You have, you have eight. So there are eight trigrams. Then they come up with hexagrams. So there are so then you have six, and uh, so there are a total of sixty-four of these. And this is the Yi Ching, and there are commentaries on the Yi Ching. There's one even ascribed to Confucius. Modern scholars, of course, debate whether you know whether that's accurate or not. I mean, I don't want to get into all this, but there, there, there's a lot of writings on the Yi Ching. There's a lot of different versions, translations, and studies, and you can refer to them. But Leibniz was convinced that he had found some form of ancient mathematics. And um, Genon quotes from this. Leibniz, uh, I think he would be German, but he wrote in fr uh, these things in French. And so uh, yeah, he cites from, and the footnote is there, it's the mathematical works of Leibniz. Uh, in French, edited by Gerhard. So you can refer to the footnote on page 46. But the passage is, is interesting. So Genon says, here, in fact, is the text of the thesis in question. This is Leibniz translated into English. What is surprising in this calculus of binary arithmetic is that this arithmetic by zero and one happens to contain the mystery of the lines of an ancient king and philosopher named, he says Fohi or Fohi, F-O-H-Y, but that's Fu Shi, something like Fu Shi, who is believed to have lived more than 4,000 years ago and whom the Chinese regard as the founder of their empire and of their sciences. There are several linear figures which are attributed to him and they are the outcomes, and they are all the outcomes, uh, and they are all the outcome of this arithmetic, but it is enough to give here the figure of the eight, he, he calls them Kova, C-O-V-A, but those are the Gua, mm. the eight trigrams, as it is called, which passes for fundamental and to add the explanation which is clear so long as it be noticed first of all that a whole line signifies unity or one and secondly that a broken line signifies zero it is perhaps more than a thousand years since the chinese lost the meaning of the gua the kova as he called them or lineations of fo shi and they have made commentaries about it in which they have sought to give i know not what far-fetched interpretations so that they have now had to receive the true one from the Europeans. So we have to wow. wait, you know, for Leibniz to come along and figure this out. Thank goodness for Leibniz. This is how it is scarcely more than two years since I sent to the Reverend Father Bouvet, a celebrated French Jesuit, living at Peking, my way of counting by zero and one, and it need no more to make him realize that it is the key to the figures of Fouchy. And he just goes on and on with this utter nonsense. Uh, so I don't want to really read the rest of that, but that gives you an idea. And then Genon says, We were anxious to reproduce at length this curious document, by means of which one may measure the limits and understanding of the man, whom we nonetheless regard as the most intelligent of all the modern philosophers. Leibniz was convinced in advance that his characteristic with a capital C, which moreover he never succeeded in constituting, and the logicians of today are scarcely more advanced could not fail to be very superior to the Chinese ideography, and the best of all is that he thinks of Fu Shi to do Fu Shi great honor in attributing to him an essay in arithmetic, and the first idea of his own little play on numbers. We seem to see here the smile of the Chinese if they had been present, presented with this rather puerile interpretation, which would have been very far from giving them a high idea of European science, but which would have been fit to make them realize very exactly its actual range. The truth is that the Chinese have never lost the meaning, or rather the meanings of the symbols in question, only they do not feel themselves in the least obliged to explain them to the first comer, especially if they judge it would be a waste of breath. And Leibniz, in speaking of I know not what far-fetched interpretations, admits in so many words that he understands nothing about it. So that is what we find when we have... <clears throat> 
people committed to this notion, this wrong-headed notion of rationalism, mm -hmm. um, rejection of secrecy, hatred of authority, hatred of, of hierarchy, this is where what you end up with. So sometimes when I discuss with people about certain Islamic occult sciences, whether it be astrology or Jeffer or what have you, they say, well, you know, where's the basis for all this? This doesn't make any sense. You know, these are, you know, how can words have numbers and what do these numbers mean? And so why do you have to, uh, you know, do it this way and that way? And these are all the same kind of sorts of objections that you find. Mm. So to conclude, um, again, it actually summarizes everything on page 94, 95. This is the chapter summary. To summarize the foregoing, to summarize the foregoing, this much can be said. Rationalism being the denial of every principle superior to reason brings with it as a practical consequence the exclusive use of reason. So again, that is at the expense of transcendent intellect, super individual intellect. But of reason blinded, so to speak, by the very fact that it has been isolated from the pure and transcendent intellect, of which normally and legitimately it can only reflect the light in the individual domain. As soon as it has lost all effective communication with the super-individual intellect, reason cannot but tend more and more toward the lowest level, toward the inferior pole of existence, plunging ever more deeply into materiality. As this tendency grows, it gradually loses hold of the very idea of truth. Look where we are today. Mm -hmm. And arrives at the point of seeking no goal other than that of making things as easy as possible for its own limited comprehension. And in this it finds an immediate satisfaction in the very fact that its own downward tendency leads it in the direction of simplification and uniformization of all things. It submits all the more readily and speedily to this tendency because the results of this submission conform to its desires, and its ever more rapid descent cannot fail to lead at last to what has been called the reign of quantity. That concludes today's lecture on chapter 13, The Postulates of Rationalism. Thank you for watching.